Welcome back to Logic 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is conditional proofs. These are going to look very similar to what we covered last time, proofs by contradiction, in that we are going to start by assuming that something is true and see what falls out as a result of that, rather than starting by just applying our rules of inference and replacement rules right off the bat. So the idea behind a conditional proof is that we want to prove a conditional statement is true. Something like P implies Q, where P and Q can be simple sentences or compound expressions, doesn't matter. We begin a conditional proof by assuming that the antecedent P is true, and then using our replacement rules and our rules of inference, we show that Q is true as well. Q must follow, given that we have assumed that P is true. Now, the reason that this works is that conditional statements tell us what must follow given that the antecedent is true. So we're sparing ourselves a little bit of hassle by going ahead and starting out by assuming that the antecedent is true and seeing where that takes us. We are literally showing that an if-then statement holds. If we assume that this is true, then this other thing must be true as well. This might help if we see an example, so here we go right now. We have three premises, P or T implies U, P implies Q, and not S or not Q. And we want to prove that S implies the implication T implies U. So we have a conditional statement in the conclusion here. Actually, we have two different conditional statements. We have one inside the parentheses and one outside of the parentheses. And so we need to be proving the overall statement here, which means we're caring about the statement that's on the outside of the parentheses, not what's on the inside. So we're going to begin our conditional proof by assuming that S is true. So line four, S, and the justification for this is that we have an assumption for a conditional proof. Notice that I have indented this line just as I would in a proof by contradiction. And the reason that I'm doing that is because anything that we show in this line as being true, we can't show as being true overall. All of the stuff that we show inside of the indentation is true as a result of us assuming that S is true, or at least the way we're justifying it is based off of having S being true. But if we've done that, we can go through this indented line as we would normally using rules of inference and rules of replacement. So if we have S as being true, well, what else do we see? Hmm. Well, I see something. Why don't you just pause this video for a moment and see if you can figure out how to do the rest of this proof, remembering that we want to ultimately conclude here that the consequent is true, given that we have assumed that S is true. So go ahead and pause the video for right now. And if you're ready for the answer, let's go ahead and see it. If you have an answer, please put it in the comment section. But if not, let's show what's what's actually going on here. So we have S as being true, and that means that through lines three and four, using disjunctive syllogism, we know that not Q is true. That's because S is true, and so if not S or not Q is true, and we know that not S is not true, then it must be that not Q is true. And if we have that not Q is true, what else do we see? Well, using lines two and also line five, we can use modus tollens to back out that not P is true. And if we have not P is true, then, well, you know what? We can use disjunctive syllogism again. On lines one and six, we have uh, P as being part of a disjunction with T implies U, but we know from line six that not P is true. So that means that the second part of line one must be true, which means we get the implication T implies U. Now we're done essentially with our conditional proof. The last thing that we need to do here is just end it. And the way we're going to end it is by taking the first line of our conditional proof and taking the last line of our conditional proof and using an implication to uh, separate those two. So line eight says the first line of the conditional proof, so line four, S, and then the last line of the conditional proof, line seven. You'll notice that we have those two lines there, and now we just have an implication separating them. And our justification here is the lines of the conditional proof, and we just call it, hey, this is a conditional proof, we're done. That's it. We have successfully shown that if S is true, then T implies U must be true as well. So that's a conditional proof for you. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.